Welcome and thank you for joining us. We'll get started very shortly. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Gray Associates Demand for Higher Education Programs webinar for January. Today we'll be going over data trends through December for community colleges. A few housekeeping items to get started with. At the bottom of your screen, there is a place labeled Q&A. If you have any questions, please feel free to click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and add your questions there. We will get to as many as we can during the session and we will definitely follow up later with you if we run out of time. Have you been wondering about launching a particular new program or what the potential job market looks like for your students? At the end of the presentation, we will give you the opportunity to review programs in real time with PES Plus and Gray's Director of Customer Success. You can pop your program request into the Q&A at any time during the presentation. And now, without further ado, I will turn things over to our CEO, founder, and best-selling author, Bob Atkins. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, Marianne, and uh, this month, as Marianne mentioned, we'll be looking at the data from December 2022 to see what's hot and what's not from an academic program standpoint. And we'll be focusing in particularly on uh, career and technical education, but as well, we'll be looking at the kinds of programs that folks transfer out to into four-year colleges. Um, all this is the foundation of the book that we wrote, um, Start, Stop, or Grow. Uh, which outlines a, a, method, a methodology for program evaluation and management that I hope will be helpful to all of you. So uh, that's available on Amazon. I will shamelessly plug it. Um, but before I do any more of that, let's get on with the meat of our presentation today. Uh, first, uh, we think it's very important as, as folks approach academic programs that they have a systematic way of doing that. Um, and so we developed what we think is probably the only program evaluation system now, as you can see, a system is more than software and data. Yes, we have a data and we think you should have data on market sphere programs, including student demand competition, uh, job offers and uh, job postings and so forth. You also need to understand your margins and whether the programs are performing adequately from an academics perspective. Are people graduating, for example? What are the DFW rates? And finally, you need to take into account the fit of a given program with the mission of the institution. So that's a foundational data, if you will. But to have a real system that works, you need to wrap the right people and process around that information. So we, we usually do workshops, but however you do it, having an open, transparent, data-informed process, we think is vital to making sound program decisions. And oftentimes people confound making program decisions with having to cut programs. Um, but in our experience, actually most of the money in program evaluation is in finding new programs to develop, or existing programs that have room for growth. That's really where you'll find the biggest uh, financial benefit and the, the, uh, because they're usually the biggest opportunity to increase enrollment. We do a few things besides program evaluation and management. We help clients with pricing and particularly discrete choice surveys. Um, so that we develop pricing simulators for them so they can actually test the impact of a price change on enrollment and institutional margins. We help with location analysis. I think it's a very interesting opportunity right now to think about adding micro campuses in some of the empty real estate that we are seeing in office buildings. Um, that geographic presence matters enormously in higher ed. Um, so it's an interesting time to be exploring uh, new locations, not necessarily full campuses, uh, but something like a micro campus where particularly the adult student can come in and have a quiet place to study. Then we have financial planning models and these are getting more and more sophisticated uh, but now we can actually run out 10 years and help you understand the implications of something like adding a program and how that will affect not only the department in which the program is housed, but also all the other departments that have to deliver what often referred to as service courses, English and gen eds, and how it will affect their enrollment and cost structure as well. So you can really get a robust view of what's likely to happen depending on not just program decisions, but other decisions on things like what my minimum class size are and so forth. So. Um, some really interesting stuff happening there. So uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, we want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to see programs that are of particular interest to you. So if you'd like to do that, please note it in the chat. Tell us what program you want. We will be doing all this at the national level, um, just in interest of speed in, in the discussion today. Um, if you don't, 
if we don't get to your program, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll send you a follow up uh, with a program scorecard for your particular program. And uh, a little bit later, you'll see a program scorecard, so you'll know exactly what I'm referring to when I say that. But there's more data on one of the, our program scorecards. You'll normally get the full program evaluation. So uh, we've got three kinds of, of data that we look at for student demand. And today we're actually going to start out with the oldest one, which is historical trends on completions. Um, that's this third item. Then we're going to come back up and look at enrollment, which is very current information. And we'll finish off with future-oriented information about Google search and non-degree courses. So what do I mean by saying these three types of data represent different timeframes? Well, what iPads measures, the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Database, and this is where all of you file your completions and a wide range of other data. Um, that's most current data is 2021. And it reflects what majors people picked for a community college three to five years before that. So we're now looking at data about what students wanted in 2018 when we look at iPads. Um, and that's now fully, what, five, six years out of date. So keep that in mind. It's a great source for overall program size, long-term historical trends and so forth. But it's not a very good source for what people want now. So we went in search of a better source, and we found the National Student Clearinghouse offers enrollment data. We've had this for a couple of years now, and it tells us what students enrolled in as recently as this spring. So we have a very good, it's very current, it's very comprehensive, 96, 97% of all schools participate, um, and it tells us what's happening in the market now. But often what we really need to know is not what is happening, but what's going to happen. And for that, we look at Google searches, because this is where students who are thinking about enrolling uh, over the next three to six or 12 months are in Google searching for programs. Um, so we keep track of all three of these things. And if you think of it as a funnel, Google's the most forward looking. The NSC is exactly current and uh, iPads data is a couple of years or more old. So what was happening? Well, um, there's some, the biggest program out there in terms of completions was medical clinical assistant with 50,000 completions uh, during this period in 2021. This is a startling uh, phenomenon because uh, medical clinical assisting actually used to have 250,000 completions a year, um, and it's dwindled to 50,000, uh, primarily due to the closure of the for-profit institutions it, this used to be a bread and butter program for. So it's, it used to be very oversaturated, um, and I think it's re reached a level now where we're probably undershooting what the market needs. Cosmetology was second, licensed practical vocational nurse third, um, we've got a couple of other healthcare things here, always big, nursing, patient care, um, EMT paramedic, all make our top 10 in terms of overall size. Then we've got some interesting things, cosmetology and esthetician, so personal care, two out of the top 10. And then I would go to more general, we've got our, our classic uh, um, technical programs, welding tech, auto mechanic, and HVAC, um, and then business, uh, business administration um, general rounds out our list. These are all programs I'm sure you're familiar with, um, but now let's take a look and see what's, what's happening right now. Um, and we get a, a, a somewhat different list. Total enrollment now, number one is not actually medical clinical assistant. Um, number one is licensed practical vocational nurse with some 92,000 students enrolled across the country. Business does come in second. Welding moves way up the list from about seventh to third. Uh, with 65,000 students enrolled. Then we see our medical clinical assistant with 50,000, bookkeeping, um, EMT paramedic, and then we have a bit of a, a, a cluster of CTE, career and technical education programs here towards the bottom, auto mechanic, cosmetology, and electrician, and of course welder a little bit further up the list. Um, so it's an interesting list, I think, to find it's four out of the top 10 are career and technical education, uh, we've got three that are healthcare, and only a couple that are really business oriented. So um, healthcare is really the dominant force in this usually, uh, but in this case, actually, it's career and technical education. And I forgot to mention criminal justice there, third from the bottom. Now, what's growing fastest? Well, none of the things we saw in our largest, by and large. Um, we've got career customer service support call center up 27%. Um, let me stop for a second and just take us back a step. Enrollment in um, community colleges is down 9%. So you'll notice 
by the time we get to the 10th fastest growing program, we're already at approximately zero with dental assisting at 1%. So 27% growth in this context is really very, very fast. Um, the second is teacher's aid. And then in our other category in the grade there, we've got legal assistant paralegal at 2%. Then we get a bunch of healthcare programs, health information, medical records tech with 8% growth, medical office management with 3%, home health aid, 2%, medical billing and coding, 2%, and dental assistant, 1%. And um, a couple of CTE programs amongst the faster growing, commercial truck and bus driver and electrical power uh, transmission installation, up 5% and 4% respectively. Um, one of the things to think about here is we, we really do have a shortage nationally of truck drivers. So establishing a commercial truck and bus driver program may make some sense. People are often deterred thinking it's got a lot of capital required that you have to buy trucks and so forth. That's really not the case. Most of the people who operate these programs are leasing those trucks and you can set it up, set up this program and if, if need be tear it down relatively inexpensively um, as a result. So um, huge employer demand not a terribly attractive profession. The pay has gone down. And of course, in many cases, you're driving across the country. It's a very, actually quite a demanding job, um, but, and not very highly paid net net. Um, some of the local truck drivers, I think actually do quite a bit better uh, than the long haul. So um, what was biggest in terms of total enrollment? Business administration general, uh, not surprising, registered nursing number two. And then we get a string of, we've actually got some sciences in here, which I found interesting. Uh, biology twice in our top 10, psychology, number four. Uh, we've got computer science in fifth place. And then criminal justice here at the bottom takes two slots. And we've got a total of two uh, business programs, bookkeeping, business administration general in, the in this top 10. And uh, again, just a couple of healthcare programs, which surprises me. Registered nursing with 689,000 students enrolled and book, um, excuse me, health services allied health general, which as I recall is sort of a catching ground for the folks who go into nursing and, and are not able to um, handle the curriculum will often end up down in a program like health services um, as a result. So uh, those two are, are very closely related. Uh, now let's talk about what's growing fastest. And uh, cybersecurity is red hot, up 14%. You see the same thing at the, uh, in terms of rapid growth at the four-year level. And uh, you also see very rapid growth in job opportunities for people with cybersecurity backgrounds. Um, I will say too, there's an important concept here. Uh, people look at cybersecurity and they think it's about technology. And a component of it is, but I think one of the things people are missing is there's actually quite a lot of the actual work that happens with cybersecurity is writing. Um, we have a person ourselves assigned now half time to fill out all the forms and answer all the questions you have to in order to get um, ISO 27001 compliant. Um, and that's not really technical work. It requires a good attention to detail, but um, it's things like write down your disaster recovery plan explain how you, uh, you know, what your policies are for password protection and so forth. So it's a lot of uh, very detailed written material that has to get done that could be done by somebody who's what I would call technically literate, but not technical. They can't necessarily program anything, um, but they can, you know, understand the terminology and write about it. So we're thinking about whether there's another angle to cybersecurity that would make it more accessible to a less technical student. Then we have real estate, um, the only business program to make the list. Uh, we've got several career and technical education programs, funeral service, customer support specialist, electrical power transmission, excuse me, uh, building construction site manager uh, with 3% growth. And just two healthcare here, diagnostic medical sonography and health services allied health general. We do have our CTEs, um, funeral and mortuary service, which I classified as CTE, but it probably isn't normally there. In, in our, um, and then electrical power transmission and building and construction site manager. Now let's actually take a look at what's going to be coming at you. What's hot in the market now that students are looking for um, who are going to be coming to your campuses over the next six to 12 months. Here's some good news for you. After all the declines we've faced, from what we can see, interest in associate and below level programs is increasing. 
So first off, how do you read my chart? Well, 2022 is the light blue bars. 2021 are the dark blue bars. And of course, the height is the number of Google searches for a given program. What we're hoping for here is light blue bars that are higher than dark blue bars. That would imply that it's growing. Um, and it is. In fact, last month, Google search volumes for associate level programs were up 31%. So there may be light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and I know it's been a very difficult time for community colleges through COVID and before, uh, but we are seeing signs that there's a, a potentially an uptick in interest in community college programs. What are people interested in? So highest volume, uh, I'm, again, we'll, we'll do the career and technical, cosmetology. Uh, you see that bus driver, commercial truck and bus driver, number two, electrician, culinary, nail, and specialist and manicurist. And then finally, in that category, HVAC maintenance tech. Then healthcare does make the list three times, medical clinical assistant, EMT paramedic, and medical billing and coding. And then we have one thing that's not in either of those two categories, legal assistant, paralegal. Um, so that's the things with the highest volume of keyword searches. So those uh, should, in theory, turn into some of the larger programs as we look forward. Now, what's growing fastest? Culinary arts, actually, is at the top of the list. And we have several other um, CTE programs that are very uh, fast growing. Nail specialist and cosmetology in particular, and electrician, actually, up 32%. Healthcare makes the list four times. Magnetic resident, uh, MRI tech, medical billing and coding, health information records tech, and finally medical clinical assistance. So we're finally beginning to bounce off that new low base of 50,000 students, uh, excuse me, 50,000 completions, and see some growth in medical clinical assistant interest. So um, I think that's important, actually, is I think we have managed to get to the point where we have a shortage of MAs out there. We have a couple of other programs that are growing very rapidly, massage therapy and business operations support. Now, some of these programs are very expensive to market. Um, others are not. But when you look at some of the bigger ones, especially those where the for-profits are very active players, uh, recruiting students online with keyword search purchases can be really costly. So here we can see some of the programs that are most expensive. Uh, medical billing and coding is a very active group of schools that compete for these, these students. Uh, particularly online, and they advertise market at a national level. So they've driven the price for a click up to $50, $49.12 to be specific. And you've got to think, if you think that through in terms of how the math works, from a click to a student, you've got a ratio of something like 100 to 1. So that $49 turns into $4,900 per student when you adjust for the fact that 99 out of 100 of the people who will click won't actually be coming to your school as a student. So it's very expensive stuff. Auto tech drops down almost 50%, but still $2,700 a student is a number to think about and $27 per click. Um, and then you see diesel mechanic, those two really go very closely together, followed by bookkeeping, physical fitness technician. Uh, you can see people starting to fight over that medical clinical assistance space here at $20. Legal paralegal, we saw the growth, but we're also seeing it's quite expensive. OTA, occupational therapy assistant, HVAC, and engineering technology general, all well north of $10 per click. Now let's transition a little bit out of what I would call the classical uh, program or certificate, you know, something like um, engineering medical, excuse me, um, HVAC, cosmetology, um, and or two-year program in say psychology into things that are really certificates, um, that may not add up to a program. In fact, most cases don't. Um, and what's popular? Well, how do you even figure that out? What we decided was one of the best indicators was to look at the guys who are doing these certificates for a living, in particular Coursera, and see what's happening in terms of volumes of students at those uh, that are taking these courses, and from that, what's hot and what's not. Um, so what surprised us, because Coursera is pretty technically oriented, you can see number three here is programming for everybody, Python. Um, is that two of the first two are really self-improvement kinds of things. The science of well-being is actually the most popular uh, certificate in the history of Coursera. So over 4.2 million students have enrolled in that course. 
Learning how to learn powerful mental tools was second with 3.4 million. Then we get what we'd expect, a tech program with 2.7 million students who've enrolled. Um, and I found that interesting to see two languages here. I think most of you um, have seen a significant decline in your language programs over the years. Um, I, it's very challenging everywhere. I'm not surprised, I'm not, it's not a criticism. I hardly know a college that doesn't have trouble filling its language classes. Um, but there is interest out there. I, it may just be in these certificates as opposed to a more formal language program. You see Chinese for beginners in fourth place here with 2.3 million students who've taken it. Um, English for career development, 1.9, I should say, enrolled in it. 1.9 million students have enrolled in that. Most likely those are foreign students trying to hone their English. And then you see data uh, at 1.4 million, financial markets, a couple of healthcare, COVID-19 tracing, um, and successful, uh, uh, no, never mind. Um, so, and technical support fundamentals on the tech side, and then finally successful negotiation is our, la is our last entrant. Highest year over year change, what's growing? There's Chinese again. Um, so languages are not dead. They're just not necessarily in traditional uh, delivery models right now. Data, data everywhere, number two. Uh, foundations of project management, number three. Science of well-being still trucking along. Uh, 494,000 additional students took that course in December, uh, enrolled in that course in December. Uh, now, I should also say, be careful. Uh, th these, an enrolled student in a place like Coursera is not the same as an enrolled student in your school. Uh, something on the order of one in 15 of these students will actually finish a program, maybe even less than that. So um, enrolling here is, is just not the same commitment as it would be coming to school. But nonetheless, a pretty good indicator of what people are interested in, which is why we keep track of it. Writing in the sciences surprised me to be as high up as it is. Then we have foundations of user experience, UX design, and technical support fundamentals. And then we have another English, uh, project planning and questions to make data driven decisions. So two of our top 10 are actually data or uh, decision making oriented, data data everywhere and data driven decisions. Now let's switch gears and look at what employers want. Um, and this is pretty much what we find most community colleges focus on. And the reason we lead off with student demand is there are many times where employers want something and students don't, and you can make big investments in what employers want only to find no students in your classes, which actually doesn't benefit the institution and doesn't benefit the employer in the end, because they, they actually still don't get the people that they need. So you do need a balance of student demand information and employment information when you're thinking about program choices. Neither one is adequate on its own. Uh, job postings by month were up 11% year over year. Uh, very good news for the economy. Uh, not necessarily great news for inflation, but um, I'm optimistic that we're going to get through this with a strong job market, even though the economy may slow down a little bit. I just don't see any signs um, that the hiring is slowing. And by the way, you all probably read about the layoffs at Google and others. Um, I think those folks are going to get snapped up in a minute by some of the big institutions, banks and others who've wanted to hire coders, but couldn't get them because they were going to Google and other um, flashier names. So I think those people are going to be soaked up very, very quickly. Um, I know we're certainly going to be in the market to hire one or more of them ourselves. Um, and so in terms of job postings, what's big? We have general and operations managers. Um, customer service reps, administrative assistants, excluding medical and executive. Uh, then we get some healthcare, uh, registered nurses, nursing assistants, home health personal aides, and a little bit further down, pharmacy technicians. Then uh, computer support specialists, maintenance workers general, and security guards. So uh, I think it, I find interesting here is that we've got a shortage of people for general management roles, um, which can really come out of any uh, program, frankly. Um, people often make the mistake of thinking that you have to be a business major in order to work in the business field. Uh, really not true at all. Uh, there are all kinds of majors that can come in and with a little experience be able to become managers um, because they're good at thinking and uh, with a little luck, they even know how to, man how to relate to other people. Um, so keep that in mind, just because you've studied one thing or a student has studied one thing, doesn't mean that that's what they'll do in the workforce. Um, there are often many other job opportunities available to them that are not correctly accounted for in traditional systems. 
Uh, where, is, where are things trending up? Um, here we see registered nursing growing um, in terms of uh, job demand, customer service reps, um, string of healthcare, home health aides, nursing assistants, pharma sec. Then we go to more general um, security guards, maintenance and repair workers, uh, computer and user support specialists. A little bit of a decline in operations managers, although remember it's off a very big base, um, and administrative assistants. Where are the, where's the money, you might well ask? Um, nursing is really getting well paid these days. The average nurse is up to 98, 99, really $100,000 when you round off. Um, diagnostic sonographers, um, 91,000. Cardiovascular techs, 82,000. I'm going to go through healthcare here. Vocational nurses are up to 68,000. I remember just a couple of years ago, that number was more to like 45,000. Um, surge techs up to 67,000. So some really good wages happening in healthcare these days. Um, construction managers, 78,000. OSHA, safety specialists, 71,000. Administrative service facilities managers, 71,000. Cost estimator, 66. And advertising and sales agents are making 65. So a lot of very well-paid healthcare fields right now making 65 to $100,000 for a two-year education. It's pretty remarkable. Now let's take a big move and look at sports. Um, we've started to keep track of this partly for fun um, and partly because sports turn out to be a very comp important component, both of campus life and campus economics. I think many of us think of sports and think, well, it's a big investment that the school kind of has to make, but it's a money loser. Um, and that can be true, especially in division one where the cost of participation can be very high. It also can be very wrong. Um, Many schools, we talk to Division three schools where they're not allowed to provide scholarships for athletics per se, um, actually make money on their sports program uh, because the revenue, the, the academic revenue from those students far exceeds the cost of offering uh, programs. By the way, not all programs, we come back to that in a moment. Some are quite expensive to run, hockey in particular. One of my favorites, but um, very expensive. So what we're seeing here is what percentage um, of enrollment are athletes at different types of colleges. And interestingly, the lowest uh, partici participation rate is actually at division one. Um, that's where your athletes are more like professionals. And they're a relatively small group of total uh, students on campus. D2 and D3, we see over 2% of folks participating. Small colleges in general, 2.04. Rodeo, um, 1.26. Community colleges in general, 0.62%. And esports is starting to come in with 0.21% our participation. Now, uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that this is a very low number, actually, these 2%. I have clients um, in D3 in particular where 40% of their students are athletes. They're playing on a sport at the school. And the coach or coaches of those teams are an integral part of the marketing and enrollment process. So as you think about sports, remember, no sport, no athlete, no student is an important equation. And I think it's a real opportunity for growth for many institutions to look out there and find sports. As uh, one of my clients said, long roster, light expense. Um, things like track where you really just need a field and you can have you know, over a dozen participants in that uh, paying tuition at your school. So I I'd never thought about it as a growth mechanism, but it absolutely is a way of increasing enrollment um, through either adding students to an individual roster or adding teams. And keep an eye on esports. Very, very fast growing. And again, as one of my clients said, you all have an esports team. Uh, some of you know it and some of you don't in the sense that your students are all playing esports now. Um, it's just a matter of whether the college recognizes that and forms a team. And again, I think it's uh, actually relatively low cost to start. You really just need high bandwidth um, as well as being something that can attract uh, students who'd like to participate in those sports. Athletics benchmarking, um, where's the growth? Uh, women's track, um, up 8.1%. Uh, baseball's up 1.9%. And as we go down the list, we've got water polo, uh, track for men, women's beach volleyball, softball, swimming, uh, and men's football, relatively slow growth rate. And finally, men's basketball actually declining a little bit um, year over year. So uh, this is where if you've got a program, there may be room to grow it, or if you haven't got a program, 
um, it's an opportunity to, to potentially get into something that's experiencing growth now in terms of student interest and participation. We've got to watch out. Not all sports are created equal financially. And I was a little surprised to see these numbers for bowling where uh, the change in expense, that's not the expense, that's the amount that's gone up, um, is actually up $5,000 per participant. I'm pretty sure that erodes most of the margin that could come from the students that are doing bowling. Uh, wrestling is actually up quite a bit as, are put, as is football. Rodeo, um, I didn't know there was co-ed women's rodeo, but anyway, and, and co-ed men's rodeo. So um, interesting, but fairly relatively expensive and increasing in cost. Uh, you can see cross-country track for women. Uh, men's golf, women's bowling, uh, not quite as expensive and not rising quite as fast as men's bowling, but still up substantially in terms of cost per participant. And then we finally have women's swimming and women's golf, both up almost $1,500 per participant. Now we're going to talk a little bit about one program and walk through how we would analyze a program as an example for you. And hopefully it's also a program that's of interest to you as well. We look at four dimensions. Um, so really, to be precise, analyzing the market for the program. And we're going to look at student demand, employment, competition, and degree fit. The program we picked this month is dental hygiene because it ranks up there in the top 20 of all programs at the community uh, two-year or community college level. Um, and you can see here that these are bars, represent the percentile rank uh, for a given program. Dental hygiene is at the 98th percentile. That's compared to all 1,500 other programs we have in our system. So it's one of the 30 highest scoring programs in the system. That's primarily the result of student demand at the 98th percentile. Um, we've got a little bit of a problem with competition. It's at the 38th percentile, but very strong employment at the 91st percentile. And then finally, degree fit um, at 100. That's because we pre-selected um, programs that are uh, appropriate for community colleges. So all of them are getting 100, if you will. We do use colors um, as we to help you interpret the charts. Dark green is 98th percentile or higher. Um, in general, green is good. Red is not so great. Uh, you see 40th percentile below there in pink. So when you look at student demand for this program, uh, Google search volumes, 97th percentile. Um, so at one of the top 3% of all programs, that'd be about uh, one of the top 45 out of 1,500 programs. And if these percentiles seem confusing, just think of them as a grade curve. Um, so the very top of the class is going to be up there in the 97th, 98th percentile. Um, international, not relevant here. Um, new student enrollment up is, I'm sorry, is it to, uh, we have 2,000 students enrolled this year. Um, nationally, 96th percentile. Completions also in the 96th percentile with 4,000, almost 4,400 students in, uh, that completed this program last year. As you would expect for a program like uh, dental hygiene, where it's primarily hands-on, not a lot of students are completing an online program. Um, and overall, between the two, we're at 4,400. Because there's no online, it drops down a shade from 96th percentile to 95th percentile. Growth is the next question. And you can look at growth two ways. How many additional students or how much interest is growing in units? And the other is to look at it and say, well, what's the percentage growth for that? And we've got both here. The unit change in Google search volumes is up a lot. 77,000 incremental searches year over year. That's 97th percentile. Enrollment is up a lot. 95th percentile with 90 and more students enrolling this year than last. Completion volume is off, um, down 1,400. But now it gets really important why you have to have all three of these metrics. So if to complete a program in 2021, I had to enroll in the middle of COVID. So what we're seeing in completions is a lingering impact of enrollment, excuse me, of COVID on enrollment and subsequently completions. What we see in Google uh, in enrollment is the, is the reversal of that. Now we're starting to have students come back to campus and get enrolled. And in Google search, we see the amount of interest that's pent up out there um, in coming to this program. So I would say the completion volume here in particular is a measure of what's happened some time ago. The uh, enrollment and Google search volumes tell us what's happening and what's going to happen and substantially more optimistic um, than the completion volume. So it's why we think it's so important to have all three indicators. And that Google search is up 18%, which puts the 72nd percentile. And the enrollment number is up 5%, which is just above the average. On dental hygienist total enrollment, um, we're down 4% 
in terms of enrollment over the time period from 19 to 22. Um, and as I mentioned, not too surprising given COVID's in the middle of all this. Um, I think we'll start to see a turnaround given the numbers we're seeing um, on the prior page in terms of Google search volumes. No guarantees, but I'm, I'm optimistic. I think the data would support that. Now, in terms of employment, this is a pretty good field. Most people who go into this actually go in part-time, which is worth considering. In terms of wages, it's a, it's a job you can do part-time normally. Um, and in particular, if you're a working mother, this, you can do this part-time in a way that you can be home in time to both get your kids off to school and pick them up when they come back. So it's a little bit different than some in terms of, uh, you know, it's not necessarily being a full-time job that people are looking for here, though it can also be a full-time job. Um, job postings are healthy, 83rd percentile. So they're not spectacular, but they're good. BLS current employment is a little bit higher, 90th percentile. And we see the 87th percentile for BLS annual job openings. Job postings, um, and this is now our ACS data, not really relevant at the two-year level. This is data that comes from the American Community Survey, but they only survey people at the bachelor's level, or they only ask about it for people who have a bachelor's degree. So it's not very representative for associates. It becomes a very important uh, number when you're thinking about students who are going to go on to a four-year program, uh, because this tells us what they actually do. So as a history major, I'm unlikely to go into the fields for which I'm directly prepared. There are only five of those according to the NCES crosswalk that's frequently used by, um, by schools as well as a number of labor market um, database guys. Um, so you gotta be careful with that because most people aren't gonna go into the field for which they're directly prepared. Um, again, at the associates level, less, than it, less of an issue. Growth here, one year down 13% um, in terms of job postings, three year down 3%. Um, the forecast is for growth, but these forecasts are a little bit noisy. Um, job postings per graduate, 2.6, mm, a little bit above average. BLS job openings per graduate, 1.9. It's relatively good. BLS 10th percentile wages, 56,000. That's 87th percentile. It's not at all bad for a two-year degree. And BLS mean wages at 73,000 um, at the 64th percentile. Above average, but not a lot above average. If we were looking at bachelor's program, I'd spend more time down here in the ACS data, but as I mentioned, that's focused primarily on bachelor's degrees, so it's not really relevant here for dental hygiene. What's going on in terms of trends? Um, you can kind of see a, a swallowtail here, if you will. Um, peaked in June last year, dropping a little bit um, as the feds tighten the, the monetary uh, faucet. So we're, we are seeing a slowdown in job postings, but it's really not bad overall. Um, we're, we're we're really running about average here as in many other areas. So while it's slowed, um, really a lot of what we're seeing in the slowdown is um, a peak that happened when people came back to work after uh, employers started hiring people back after COVID. And uh, that caused a big peak in job postings. That's subsiding, um, but we're still well above 2019 levels in most areas, including this one. So um, what kinds of jobs are people looking for uh, or employers um, trying to hire? And general hygienist is generally the answer. Registered dental hygienist, RDH is number two. We have industrial, RDH benefits, dental technician, other things related to this field, but dropping off pretty quickly. This is primarily a field where people are trying to hire hygienists to work in the dentist's office. Competitive intensity, yes, we have some. A lot of schools offer this. Um, 226 nationwide, 95th percentile, so right up there in terms of competitive intensity. Um, in, uh, in terms of program size, typically it's uh, the average is about 19. More typical representation would be median at 17. And remember, every one of these is quite expensive. You've got to have a full dental setup um, for each student. Uh, you can run more than one class um, in here, but you do need that lash up. So in many cases, my experience, this is capped really by the number of seats that a school has and, and really what it can afford to do in terms of the setup per student. Um, so that 17 is uh, not a huge cohort coming through, but it's not bad. Um, if you think about that, that's two years. So it's 35, 45 students when you adjust for uh, completion rates um, taking this program at any given time. That is down a bit. That's worrisome. 
Uh, the median's down three. That means people are having trouble filling their classes. Um, and that, that does worry me when I see that statistic. Um, Google cost per click, not too bad, $9. And the competition index here is right about average at 46 percentile. So while it, there are a lot of campuses, the level of competition here is not yet toxic. And as we mentioned before, not a lot going on online for this for obvious reasons. What's the appropriate degree level for this program? Well, most folks, 63%, are gonna get a, a um, associate's degree. Now, there is a smattering, uh, well, more than a smattering, 33% will end up with a bachelor's degree. And one of the clients I was just at has a bachelor's in, in um, dental hygiene. So it's not, a, not that unusual, um, but the majority are gonna be at the associate's level. In terms of the workforce, 51% associates, 32% bachelors, and some folks with no college who've gone through and been trained one way or another. Uh, more, I see this more for dental, um, uh, other dental programs where they can actually come get it, get uh, um, dental assistance where they can get the, the certification without a degree. Um, you'll often see that some college or no college be pretty prominent. Uh, not so common when you're talking about dental hygienists. Who's taking this program? And this is important when you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion on your campus. Every program has its own demographic profile. And if you emphasize a given program, you are unconsciously emphasizing a certain demographic. In this case, 61% of the folks who become dental hygienists or, or take dental hygiene programs are white women. So you're, you're going to skew that way. By the time we include Hispanic women, we're at 76%. Um, Asian women, we get to 93. So if, you're, if your campus is already 60, 40, female, male, which is the average for the United States, this program would skew it even more towards women. Almost no men, for some reason, become dental hygienists. Why not? I don't know. Perfectly good profession, reasonably well paid, lots of demand, but men don't do it. And finally, we put all that together on a page for you so you can look at one page and be able to make a reasonably informed preliminary decision about whether this is a program that's worth pursuing in any further depth. Let me wrap up for you, and then we'll open the floor to look at some programs you may be interested in. Um, in December, thank God US searches um, for community college programs increased 31%. I hope that begins to materialize in your admissions funnels and on your campuses. Customer support call center had the fastest enrollment growth of all the certificates. At the associate level, cybersecurity grew the fastest. So if you haven't got a cybersecurity program, now's the time. From 2015 to uh, 2021, women's track had the highest partition, participation rate of community college athletic teams. Uh, men had the highest increase in expenses per team, not a prize we really want to win. Uh, job postings were up 11% in December, in particular for general and operations managers. And demand for dental hygienists is strong, both in terms of students wanting to take the program and uh, employers wanting to hire dental hygienists. Let me pause there. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, has Wynnell joined us? He has. And Wynnell, we do have a request to take a deeper dive into medical building, billing and coding. Coming right up. If there are other programs you all would like to look at, um, please enter them in the chat, um, and we'll be glad to glad to take a look. Okay, my screen share is loading. Let me know when you can see it. We can. Nice. Medical billing coding fifty one oh seven one three. Awesome. So I'm about to open up the scorecard, which is the detailed screen uh, that Bob just showed. Um, before I do that, you know, the system is already going to show us we're expecting to see some strength in student demand and employment and lots of competition. Now let's try and find the details that support that here. Sure enough, student demand is dark green. You see dark green student demand specifically in the size. Right, so some of on ground and online completions, online completions, on ground completions, enrollment, and Google search volumes are all very strong in this case. Notice how big online is here. Um, 
almost half, well, a little bit less than half of all completions here are taking place online. Google search volumes have increased uh, by a large amount here year over year in units as well, which is something to highlight. Um, 101,000 units increased year over year. That's a 36% increase. We're seeing some overall decreasing volumes in completion and, and enrollment here in units and percentages as well. Okay. When I look over to the right, I see employment, uh, very strong job postings totals, um, BLS current employment, so a large field of current people working in, in it, um, BLS annual job openings. So a lot about openings recognized by BLS as well. So the size of direct prep jobs is very large here. And that's going to be recognized by a lot of this dark green that we see. Okay. Yeah, it is dropping a bit though. Um, the historical growth down 4%. Um, three years down 2% um, annually. So that's a bit of a concern. But plenty of job postings per grad, right? We're now we're at 8.4. Um, yes, so the job opportunities for your graduates are still very healthy. And the mean wage is at 40,000. Um, you know, in this case, it is going to be an eighth percentile mean wage for this. Yeah, it's done pay very well. So, overall strength in student interest, um, overall strength in employment, there's a lot of opportunities, although the, the pay is, is a little low here. Um, you know, the story really is in the competition. Uh, before we before we dive into that, right, our system is designed to kind of break down the percentage of completions. In this case, you know, we already know that for something like this, it's going to be associates and below. For other programs, it may not be so clear, but we can see kind of 28% of completions nationally, you know, are happening at the associates level and 72% of the completions nationally for this SIP code are at the certificate level. Um, and then lots of pink uh and pink usually isn't the best color that you want to see in the scorecard for competition but you know we're going to kind of dive into why right 555 campuses with graduates that's a 96 percentile value right so there's just a lot of campuses currently in this game here offering this program um this has dropped by 39 campuses year over year average and median completions of 16 and 10 respectively here the median completion size continues to drop here at down 27%. Um, relatively expensive cost per click here, uh, $35. It's going to be a 99th percentile value. Um, and the competition index, which kind of ranges here from zero to one, the closer to one, the more um, competitive it is to, to kind of play in the space, is at a 92nd percentile here. I think what we're seeing here with Nell, this is a very popular program in the online and for-profit or kind of quasi-for-profit space. And so they do their math and they're willing to pay a lot of money to get a student. Um, so it, it makes it a very competitive program in particular online. Um, so it may not be super attractive for all of you to play um, in the online space for this one, uh, given the intensity of competition there. On mm -hmm. ground, I think is a different um, equation because those folks aren't really competing in that market. Mm -hmm. I just want to come back into the program rank here. I see a couple in the chat. I know I had a couple other ones as well. Um, I had bookkeeping and accounting, cosmetology. I see physical fitness, IT support. Let's see what we can find here. And for the physical fitness, health, well-being related programs. So mm -hmm. Dale Van Dam, I'm assuming that you're you're speaking of more like physical therapists and training. But if I'm wrong, please please let us know. Physical fitness. Hmm. I don't know if there's an actual zip code for that. Physical fitness tech. Does that sound right to you, Bob? Yeah, I think at that level, it would be, that's probably right. Um, you know, you could go, you could look at trainer as well, personal trainer, something like that. Cool. 
We'll go ahead and look at the one. Um, that's fine. It's a good place to start. Yes. And we did hear back, hear back from Dale. He said personal trainer slash recreation slash health and wellness. Yeah, I think that that's under personal trainer. I don't think that's a... Oh, I've seen it. Oh, what's it called? Try trainer. Yeah, I've never seen really? that one. Um, maybe health. Health and wellness general, I feel like, is where that's going to fall into. Could be. Um, so let's look at that one here and we'll see what we can find. A program of study that prepares individuals to assume roles as health and wellness professionals in private business industry community. Personal health, community health, welfare, nutrition, fitness and exercise and health behaviors. Seems kind of like a one size fit all yeah. for this. Um, The one thing that strikes me here is uh, it is a 72% bachelor's program. So I'm not sure if the intention would be associates and below for this. And there might be another zip code for that. So, you know, if we were spending time together, we'd probably spend a good amount of time here just trying to figure out what the best zip code would be. But for this, let's just look at this one for now. Um, uh, the other one we could look at in a minute, go ahead and look at this one is, is that physical fitness technician? I was looking, I looked that up. It looks like it's pretty, pretty in tune with what he's, what, what Dale's interested in. Okay. So for health and wellness general, um, you know, nationally, we see some of on ground on, on line completions at the 86th percentile, um, online completions at the 95th. So it's relatively large program online compared to its total, um, completions. Um, you know, job postings in the pink here. Uh, my guess would be, you know, the job postings are relatively low. Um, not sure why, maybe a lot of freelancing type of jobs associated with this. I'm not sure, but, you know, relative to the market, not the largest amount of job postings here. Pay is not great either. You know, I look at this, if I were, if you came to me and you were, you, you know, you had this idea, um, you could almost answer the question of, and you were thinking about a new program. Um, you see the two pinks on employment competition, student demand's not great. Uh, you know, you can afford to be very picky about what new programs you offer. You're only gonna be able to do, what, two, maybe five programs a year. So uh, you really have to be very selective for those. So the minute I see any warning signs, my view is not that this is a bad program. If you already had it, uh, you might keep it but you probably don't want to start it because it's not because it's not good, but because there's something better out there you could be doing. Let's take a quick look at the other one, the um, physical, uh, the technician for this category, physical fitness technician, there it is, yeah. It's in the 31, so. Yeah, not great. Seeing the same kind of pattern, um, reasonable student demand, Kind of average, maybe a little bit better on enrollment. Uh, not good on employment. What are wages here? Yeah, thirty-five thousand um, dollars for a BLS mean wage here, third percentile. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious about you know kind of what jobs we're tying directly to this as well for that direct prep. Yeah. Um, Any others um, anybody would like to look at? I think I saw IT support. I'm not sure the exact. Yeah, you'll have to spell it out. Hmm. I'm going to have to Google it. One second. 
And while you're getting ready, Winnell, we're gonna launch a very short poll. Uh, it just helps us get feedback on how we're doing and so we can make improvements. And um, I'll go ahead, I'm gonna, I think we can, uh, we'll wrap up right after Winnell is through with this particular one. Um, do note that when you're trying to find a, a zip code, the fastest thing you can possibly do is look in Google. They're really good at, at um, taking taking the query and finding a zip code for you. So even our systems can't beat them. Um, and uh, we very much appreciate your joining us today. Uh, I want to encourage all of you to use the kinds of things that Gray offers for free. So this webinar is an example. On our website, you'll find all sorts of information about the industry. You're welcome to draw on that. The materials for this webinar are available to you uh, online shortly after done. You're welcome to share those with your colleagues if you'd like. Um, please, uh, if you, you know, are interested in program evaluation, the book is out there. I think it's $25 on Amazon and really gives you a description of how to go about doing program evaluation and management um, in today's world. So thank you all for joining us. I'll leave you with one to wrap up this particular program. Yeah, this is going to be an example, you know, another one where, you know, my guess would be that it's, it's being reported in so many different SIP codes. I'm not finding I think this is information technology technician is what it's called. I'm not finding. Yeah, IT is going to pick up a, um, a lot of other things. Um, I just want to break down of the award level completions here to see if there's any associates and below completions because it might be that it could just be like an information technology associates level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing see twenty one percent certificate, seventeen percent associate. Um, so it's getting bundled in with the higher level, you know, higher level degrees as well. Correct. Yeah. So IT, of course, is going to show a lot of strength in student demand and employment. Um, and the question with IT always really is going to be, you know, the competition and the market that you're currently trying to serve into. And how do you compare to the competition? Um, in this case, we're seeing a lot of strength in student demand, both in size and growth, employment in job openings. So size, direct prep, wages are strong as well. Um, especially in that ACS pathway. Um, and then 22 average program completions. So the average is pretty large and the median here at six. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of big players in this national market here, for sure. It's pretty much what you see here. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna run out of demand for um, IT tech support people anytime soon. Uh, we will run out of supply. They're hard to find. Yeah. And keep in mind, like if we were reviewing this together a little bit deeper on a different call, you know, we'd want to take a deeper dive into this 222,000 Google search volume and see how much of it is for, you know, like an IT course or online or certificate search volumes to get a better understanding of kind of the IT support role. And similar in the job postings, right, we're going to be able to filter through those job titles to get an understanding of, um, you know, what kind of level of expertise are these job postings looking for to help kind of get a better or more clear understanding of, um, you know, IT in respect to, you know, the goal or the type of program that you're looking to launch. And that's all data that's available in the, in the uh, sister systems along with this. Exactly. Great. Well, thank you all very much. We'll wrap it up for today. And I hope you'll join us again next month um, when we'll be coming back and telling you what, what's happened during the month of January. <laughs>